So we are continuing in our study of Revelation today, and we come to the conclusion of chapter 1, where we read verses 9 through 20. This is God's word to his people. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels, are messengers of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Although the message of Revelation certainly can at times seem to us a bit mysterious, a bit hidden in its meaning, what is revealed to John is immeasurably practical in a number of ways. Verses 9 through 20 introduce Revelation's practical charge to us. To begin with, Revelation teaches us that there are practical consequences to our calling. The notion of our calling is vital because it involves what we will do with our lives. The nature of our calling, according to the Puritan William Perkins, is divided into the categories of general and practical or particular calling. General calling is the gospel, which is extended to everyone indiscriminately. We will either choose to follow Jesus or we will choose to follow a false narrative of this world. The choice will define us. It is imperative that you correctly respond to the call of the gospel because the consequence is a matter of eternal life or eternal death. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, that whoever does not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Fortunately, understanding and responding to the gospel is simple. It is straightforward. It involves praying something along these lines. Holy God, I know that I have sinned against you. I confess my sin, and I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ died for me and that he rose in power to deliver me from sin's grip and guilt. Paul says it plainly in Romans 10, verse 9. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Do not confuse. Do not doubt. 
this general calling. Do not add to it. Do not subtract anything from it. In Acts chapter 16, the jailer at Philippi asked Paul and Silas, what must we do, what must I do to be saved? And in verse 31, they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus. You will be saved. While our belief in the gospel shapes who we are as Christians, our particular calling shapes what we do as Christians. John was the last living apostle, and as verse 9 indicates, he was in exile. An early church father reports that John had to work on the island of Patmos in the marble quarries. And that helps explain to us why John refers to himself as a companion in tribulation. Here was an aging man, but part of his particular calling involved forced menial labor. It was not something that he would have chosen to do on his own, but it was what he had to do in light of his circumstance. But you must remember that this work did not define John. It was John's personal relationship with Jesus that defined him. It was something here that he is in the marble quarries as part of his calling at this particular point of his life, but it wasn't what defined him. It wasn't what he chose to do. And I say that because it's where the Lord chose to place him. And that's true of us, too. Sometimes where the Lord chooses to place us is not what we have in mind. It's not what we're thinking about where we're supposed to be in a particular time or season. So I believe that what we see with John is practical for what we should see in our own lives. How so? One, your work, your paycheck, your title, your public accolades, your circumstances, and so on, None of those define you. Your relationship with Jesus Christ is what defines you. Oz Guinness says, we may live in one town a long time or a short time. We may have a job that is poorly paid or that is well rewarded. We may have friendships that are rich and fulfilling or thin and disappointing. We, we may have a resume that is checkered or impressive, but for the follower of Christ, none of these things, none of them finally determine the meaning of our lives. What matters is that we follow the call of God. Two, your particular calling takes shapes in different ways and at different seasons. And your particular calling will look different from mine, because your calling is distinct to your life. At one point, a person might feel called to serve as an accountant, but then later, that same individual might sense a call to serve as a middle school math teacher. I know, crazy, right? At various points, people might not feel inclined either to do what they are forced to do at all. Financial obligations might require people to work two jobs, or it might require that they work a job they dislike, or they never aspired to do at all, like work in the marble quarries as an aging man in exile. Oswald Chambers once wrote that it requires the supernatural grace of God to live 24 hours in every day and go through drudgery as a disciple, to live an ordinary, unobserved, ignored existence as a disciple of Jesus. It is inbred in us that we have to do exceptional things for God, but we have not. We have only to be exceptional in the ordinary things to be holy in mean streets, among mean people. And that, my friends, is not learned in five minutes. Three, 
It is far too narrow to relate our particular calling as one's vocation, as a lawyer, as a meteorologist, as a farmer, as a homemaker, as a medical practitioner, as someone who serves in the military, as an administrative assistant, as a financial advisor, as a manual laborer, and so on. I say it's far too narrow because as long as we have breath, our general calling in Christ means that we will always have a particular calling. What helped an aging John to go on day by day at Patmos doing manual labor? Why did he live so long? Simply this, Christ still had work for him to do. Prior to the revelation, John is cut off from his churches by the decree of an unholy Rome. The gospel has seemingly proven ineffective against this unstoppable evil. But then without a single thing happening to change the governance of Rome, John is given a message. The exiled, aging John in the marble quarry is now the empowered John with a renewed calling as pastor. Rome had tried to shut John away, to prevent churches from seeing him, to present, prevent churches from hearing what he had to say. But the Holy Spirit filled his eyes with sights and his mouth with speech that have given comfort and confidence to Christians across every age since. Sometimes people have asked me what their remaining purpose is. Most typically, this happens among those who are aging or among those who have outlived a number of their friends and loved ones or among those who find themselves now dealing with some debilitating illness. All that I can say is that the Lord keeps us here until our work for Christ is done. Psalm 31.15 says, our time is in God's hands. As Christians, we are never uncalled. We may retire from our jobs, but we never retire from our calling as the people of God to proclaim his grace and his goodness to the world. John was living by faith, bearing his cross and following in the way of Christ until the end. Trials in various and sundry ways will come to us all. Will we, like John, remain faithful? This leads to our second practical charge from Revelation. It is the challenge for the church. The general call of Jesus demands a personal response. No one can make the choice to follow Christ for us. But this does not mean, it cannot mean, that the gospel message is in any way individualistic. No, when Jesus summons his followers, it is as a corporate calling. It is to be part of of a body of believers. God wills for there to be a church. From the calling out of Israel until now, the life of faith always takes place in a community of persons and geographical proximity. A church is composed of persons who eat food in local markets, who work jobs to advance a local economy but who are set apart in these local settings to shine a light for Jesus. The lampstands in John's vision signify the church. We are not the light. Jesus is the light. Yet the Holy Spirit tabernacles in us. That is why John references the church as lampstands. It is to remind us of the golden menorah that Moses had placed in the tabernacle to symbolize the light of the Lord that should never go out. 
we gather here in this sanctuary, in this geographical proximity, in this local area to go where we live in order to bear witness to the light of Jesus. That's in the local marketplace. That's in our jobs. That's with our neighbors. So we are here as the church to go there as the church. So let's define the church. It is a local voluntary band of brothers and sisters who have been set apart and united together as God's lampstands in order to tabernacle for Jesus, arm in arm, no matter what comes at us. The year was 480 BC when 38-year-old King Xerxes of Persia and his 80,000 grand army marched out from Susa. As they sought to expand the Persian Empire, Xerxes determined to have his way with Greece. The only thing that stood in the way of this massive army was a ragtag force of 7,000 Greeks from five city-states led by the 55-year-old Spartan Prince Leonidas. The Greeks took their stand in a narrow pass 20 yards wide, bounded by the sea on one side and the 5,000-foot cliffs of Mount Calidromos on the other. For the massive Persian infantry. This had to look nothing more than a fight with a collection of gnats. Yet for two straight days, the unstoppables of Xerxes were stopped. Even his crack division called the Immortals were set down with significant casualties by Leonidas and his soldiers. Sadly, a traitor betrayed Leonidas, led the Persians over the cliffs to surround his soldiers on the third morning. Death was coming as sure as the dawn, so Leonidas dismissed everyone except for 300 of his own Spartan men. There, Leonidas and his 300 fought against that collection of soldiers from Persia until the last man had died. But before their defeat, Leonidas sent home this stirring message that has become their epitaph, stranger, tell the Spartans that we behaved as they would wish us to and are buried here. Those last words would trigger a surge of pride among a divided Greek nation, inspiring their fellow countrymen to decisive victories over Persia. Never again would the Persians menace Greece. The French philosopher Montaigne would say 2,000 years later, there are triumphant defeats that rival victories. You see, the sacrifice of some lead to the victory for countless others, having just celebrated the 80th anniversary of D-Day on the beaches of Normandy, we can certainly say that is true, can we not? Church, let it also be said of us as a voluntary, willing band of God's Spartans. Passerby, tell our Lord that we have behaved as he would wish us to behave and are buried here. It is what I think adequately expresses John's words for the church faced with coming armies against it. Revelation was not written for individuals concerned only with getting his or her soul to heaven. No, Revelation was written to people in Christian communities who were forced to come to terms with hard political, social, and religious life and death decisions. How and among whom would they stand? 
when armies more fierce than the Persian armies breathed down heavily upon them. How and among whom will we stand? We must stand for Jesus and we must stand together as his church. Throughout the world, Christian churches continue to deal with severe persecution and some nations just claiming Christ as Lord leads to imprisonment or death. In the United States, voices increasingly devalue the place of Jesus. He traced the trends as it pertains to faith and the church. What you see is a significant decrease and conversion, a significant decrease, decrease in commitment. In other words, fewer people express commitment to faith in Christ and more people, even those who say they're committed to Christ, become less and less involved in carrying out his mission with the church. Ah, I'll just sit at home and watch it on TV. No one even has to know that I'm a Christian at all because it's a lot more comfortable. I'm not going against culture. I'm not speaking out about what is true and right and good and loving. Both of those scenarios, marked by either physical or philosophical persecution, demand that we remain arm in arm together, even when we are but 300 pitted against the swords of 800,000. In Acts chapter 14, verses 21 and 22, Paul and Barnabas returned to the churches at Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships before entering the kingdom of God, they said. And plus, do not miss why Revelation 1.9 said that John was on the island of Patmos to begin with. It was on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And therein is the practical charge to believers in the church. The faithful Christian will not shrink back from proclaiming the truth of God's word and the gospel message of Jesus Christ, even in the face of all types of persecution. And so I charge you as a messenger of God to the church with these words. These are the Lord's words, and they're spoken over you. Isaiah 54, verse 17, no weapon forged against you will prevail. And you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. Philippians 1, 27 to 30. Whatever happens, no matter what comes, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Second Corinthians 4, 8 through 10, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. So just as King Jehoshaphat prayed to God when facing daunting enemies in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 12, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. And that's the crux of the matter, I think. The churches of Asia Minor might not know what to expect to do in the coming days, but they could fix their eyes 
on the centrality of Christ. You and I might not know what to expect or what to do in our coming days, but we can fix our eyes on the centrality of Christ. On the occasion in John 6, verses 19 and 20, when the fearful disciples had just seen Jesus walk to them on water, Jesus says, I am, fear not. Why? Because nothing lies outside the influence, the power, and the control of our Christ. Whom or what then shall we fear? Nothing. No trouble or tribulation. Neither death nor the grave. But perhaps our vision has become too weak. Perhaps we merely imagine a Jesus who walked around Palestine with some dense fishermen helping and healing people along the way and speaking several suitable verses for Sunday school memory or to put on a plaque and hang on our walls. If so, John's revelation wants to train us to re-see the centrality of Christ. The apostle wants for us to have a fuller vision, a right vision, a true vision of who Jesus is. I say this to you. He is the son of man dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest and with hair white like wool, as white as snow. The Christ that we must see is our high priest. The garment described that he is wearing is the same garment worn by Aaron in his priestly work. Part of Aaron's priestly work was to make a sacrifice every year because of his own sin needed covering, as well as that of the corporate community. But not so with Jesus. The description of Christ's hair points us to his perfect purity and to the prophecy of Isaiah 1, verse 18. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be made like wool. As our high priest, Christ perfectly fulfills the law and he grants to us his purity and the righteousness that we need, that we must have to stand before a holy God. Another part of Aaron's priestly work was to serve in the temple and keep the menorah lamps lit. The enrobed son of man now stands where? Among the lampstands, among the church, having sent the Holy Spirit to keep the lights ablaze within us as the walking, breathing temple of God. If we regret a mess that we are in, or if we aspire to become more than what we currently are, the Son of Man, as our high priest, promises help. He has sent out the Holy Spirit. Church, keep your eyes on this Christ. I say this to you. He is the Son of Man whose eyes blaze like fire and whose feet glow like bronze in a furnace. The Christ we must see is our King. And in order for us to see that, John draws out an intentional contrast between Jesus and Nebuchadnezzar's dream at the end of Daniel chapter 2. The metallic statue in King Nebuchadnezzar's dream represents four worldly kingdoms, all of which are set upon a flawed base, all of which are destined to fail. 
Later in chapter 10, however, Daniel encounters a truly superb construction supported by legs of burnished bronze. This is the same son of man that, Jesus, that John sees in Revelation. Jesus, whose eyes can see all. Jesus, who purifies all, will tread this world in power to judge the world in truth. He is an all-knowing ruler with a sure foundation, unlike the kingdoms and rulers of this earth, which will all falter. They will all fall. At Christ's miraculous conception, the angel said to the Virgin Mary in Luke chapter 1, verses 32 and 33, he will be great. And he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign forever over Jacob's descendants. His kingdom will never end. Jesus wins. He is king. And his victory, his victory will be eternal and reign throughout eternity. Church, keep your eyes upon this Jesus. I say this to you. He is the son of man whose voice was like the sound of rushing waters and who holds the seven stars in his right hand with a sharp double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. The Christ we must see is our prophet. John's comparison of the Messiah's voice is to that of rushing waters that you see in Ezekiel 1, verse 24, in the voice of Yahweh. That comparison appears again in Ezekiel 43 and verse 2. When Ezekiel goes into exile, the glory of Yahweh goes with him. And that's also true for John in exile on Patmos. He is not alone. For the glory of Jesus goes with him. I hope you catch it. You are never alone so long as the word of God goes with you. Hebrews 4.12 says that it is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of men. The word, like refreshing waters, flow through us and thunder out of us. We cannot hold it back. The word, like a two-edged sword, encourages us and convicts us. We cannot remain unchanged by it. The refreshing waters of the prophetic word and the convicting sword of the prophetic word reminds me of Peter's sermon at Acts chapter 3, verses 19 through 23. I encourage you to read it. And then we see that Christ holds the seven stars in his mighty right hand. This could refer to guardian angels over the churches, or this could refer to preachers who deliver the word faithfully to the church. Either way, it indicates Christ's watchful, loving protection over his people. In John 10, verse 28, the good shepherd says, no one can snatch them out of my hand. Can we not find encouragement there? Church, keep your eyes upon this Jesus. Finally, I say this to you. The Son of Man is the first and the last. The one who died but is yet alive again, whose face shines like the sun in all its brilliance. This teaches us a mystery, but an all-important one. The Christ we must see in all his brilliance is fully God, yet fully man. Jesus is the eternal God who came as temporal man to take our place, to die for our sin, and to overcome 
the grave. That is how, that is why he holds the keys over death and Hades for us. Oh, church, that we would keep our eyes upon this Jesus. Because if you do, Christ will make your face to shine like the sun as well. If you do, you will never be overcome or overrun by darkness and fear, no matter what tribulation you might face. Jesus says in John 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life and that light for eternity. 1 John chapter 5, verse 5 tells us, who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Have you claimed him? Have you believed on him? Church, more than anything, Revelation's practical charge to us is that we would keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Are there things in Revelation that are mysterious? Yes. Are there things in Revelation that are complex, debatable? Yes. But there is a central truth that runs, not just through Revelation, but from Genesis to the end of Revelation. And his name is Jesus. Centrality of Christ. Fix your eyes upon him. Let's pray together. Lord, by your spirit, issue this charge to your church that we would respond to your call, the gospel call and the call of our lives to live for that gospel. And we as a church would stand together and we would face whatever comes at us in the strength and the presence of Christ. And that we would keep our eyes fixed upon our priest, upon our king, upon our prophet, whose word stays with us, whose reign lasts for eternity, and whose work at Calvary and resurrection from the tomb grants us life restored with you, Father. Oh, let us receive this charge today, we pray. Jesus, in your name. Amen.